Good morning, dear devotees. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, Canto 10, Chapter 15, Verse 43. <clears throat> um, I'll read the verse. I think this verse is in the same meter as the Brahma Samhita. I think so. We'll chant it that way anyway and see what happens. We'll see. Um, <clears throat> so this Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 15, Verse 43, it says, Pitva Mukunda Mukasara Gamakshi Bringais Tapam Jahur Virahajam Vraja Yoshi Tohni Tatsat Kritim Samadigam Yavivesha Goshtam Savri Dahasavinayam Yadapanga Moksham. And the translation says, with their bee-like eyes, the women of Vrindavan drank the honey of the beautiful face of Lord Mukunda, and thus they gave up the distress they had felt during the day because of separation from him. The young Vrindavan ladies cast sidelong glances at the Lord, glances filled with bashfulness, laughter, and submission. And Sri Krishna completely accepting these glances as a proper, proper offering of respect, entered the cowherd village. Purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada says, in Krishna, oh, actually, I think this is past Srila Prabhupada. This is Srila Prabhupada's disciples writing the purport. <clears throat> so, they say, in Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Srila Prabhupada describes this incident as follows. All the gopis in Vrindavan remained very morose on account of Krishna's absence. All day they were thinking of Krishna in the forest or of him herding cows in the pasture. When they saw Krishna returning, all their anxieties were immediately relieved, and they began to look at his face the way drones hover over the honey of the lotus flower. Mm. When Krishna entered the village, the young gopis smiled and laughed. Krishna, while playing the flute, enjoyed the beautiful smiling faces of the gopis. The Supreme Lord Sri Krishna is the supreme master of romantic skills, and thus he expertly exchanged loving feelings with the young cowherd girls of Vrindavan. When a chaste young girl is in love, she glances at her beloved with shyness, jubilation, and submission. When the beloved accepts her offering of love by receiving her glance and is thus satisfied with her, the loving young girl's heart becomes filled with happiness. These were exactly the romantic exchanges taking place between beautiful young Krishna and the loving cowherd girls of Vrindavan. Hmm. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yena Butale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swa Padantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Butale Srimate Bhaktivedanta Swamini Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Hmm. Okay, so I'll read this verse one more time just so it's fresh in our memory and for any latecomers. Just the translation here, it says, With their bee-like eyes, the women of Vrindavan drank the honey of the beautiful face of Lord Mukunda, and thus they gave up the distress they had felt during the day because of separation from him. The young Vrindavan ladies cast sidelong glances at the Lord, 
glances filled with bashfulness, laughter, and submission. And Sri Krishna, completely accepting these glances as a proper offering of respect, entered the cowherd village. Okay. Good morning, dear devotees. So let's see. I had something that I wanted to read to all of you. So we are reading from this chapter of the killing of the the Nuka demon. And um, this is after, right? This is after the killing has happened. And now um, the forest is safe from the demons and the gopis um, and the rest of the inhabitants of Vrindavan feel safe to come into the forest. And this is a small explanation of the of the interchange of spiritual emotions that are happening between the gopis and Krishna. And this is very, um, you know, I feel very hmm, not qualified to speak on these, on these um, exchanges because they're very esoteric and they're very deep and they're very personal. And um, I will share a little bit about like the the esotericness that's going on but i'll speak more about a bigger topic which i'm uh finding from this little passage here um so mainly what we're seeing and you know first of all when we're reading 10th canto of bhagavatam we have to be extremely we have to read it with an extremely spiritual lens with an extremely you know as as pure as our hearts can be, <laughs> we have to read it in this way because there's a danger of reading 10th Canto of Srimad Bhagavatam and reading these types of exchanges between the gopis and Krishna, reading about um, Krishna's loving exchanges, right? And thinking it's something mundane, thinking it's something um, just, yeah, ordinary. And there's absolutely nothing ordinary about what's happening here. And therefore, we have to read with a little bit of um, uh, carefulness and a little bit of, um, or a lot bit of kind of uh, awe and respect, I think, um, for these goings on. Because I think it's 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 nice to read something like this. And this is kind of where I'm headed in my first point. It's really beautiful to read something like this and think, oh, wow, the gopis are exchanging like this with Krishna. This is so beautiful. And you can even dive really deep into the tattva, specifically rasa tattva that's being spoken of here, which I'll speak about in a minute. But I think it's it's one thing to know this on kind of like a on a logical or on an intellectual level, like yes, I'm understanding all of these things. And there it's another thing to to be experiencing these things. And I, for one, can say I am not experiencing bhav on the level of the gopis i don't know about all of you but i am not <laughs> and so um we have to be a little bit careful here so okay we'll start with this point around um this reciprocation that's going on right this reciprocation that's going on between the gopis and krishna uh the gopis kind of shyness and bashfulness and their laughter and their glances and their submission towards Krishna and Krishna's kind of mutual decision to receive that and and take that in it's it's really beautiful and I can't um like I said I don't feel qualified to get into the specifics of this but I think it's really nice to know and it's really nice to hear uh from someone who can so this is from the purport I just wanted to read uh to all of you of Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. This is his purport. And he is speaking here. <laughs> okay. So Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, taking their gazing as an offering from their hearts. I think that's so beautiful. Krishna is taking their the gopis gazing as a as an offering from their hearts. Krishna became aware of the great sweetness of the gopis' love. Fully accepting those glances with complete relish, that supreme master of romantic arts entered into the village of Raj. And Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains there is a meaning 
in the two actions of offering and accepting the bashful smiling. The gopis offering respect was their bashful laughing, submission and sidelong glances. Krishna accepted their offering by responding with enchanting glances. One can elaborate on the scene as follows, taking the flower of their glances offered by their servants called the Sanchari Bhava of enthusiasm in the hands of their eyes and taking the flower of their smiles offered by the servants called the Sanchari Bhava of joy in their hands made of their delicate lips. The Vraj gopis approach Krishna saying, please accept these offerings, which are all that we have in our house. When Krishna engaged his servant in the form of his glance to accept the gifts, his crafty glance became eager to steal the gifts, which were previously kept within the gopis' houses. Therefore, Krishna withdrew his glance to himself. When the gopis offered these gifts again, Krishna's glance freed itself and quickly approached the gopis to steal the two gifts with the vigor of a warrior. Mm. But then a sakhi in the form of bashfulness, who has the power to cover things, suddenly appeared and hid the two gifts. Then another Saki named Vinaya, submission, arrived, and a fight broke out between them. <laughs> Krishna's servant, in the form of his glance, however, forcibly took the gift of the gopis' glances along with their bashfulness and submission and offered them to Krishna. Receiving these three like a precious jewel, Krishna carefully placed them upon the altar in the temple of his heart. This is the implication of the word satkritim, offering. Although bashfulness and other words have their own power of implication, because satkritim and moksha have such deep meanings, they have been explained here in detail. And so this is really interesting. It's really fascinating because what um, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is mentioning here, especially the end, this really important point that even though those words um, of bashfulness or of, um, you know, submission like this that are being used, they have their own meaning in and of themselves. He's saying that the higher meaning or the deeper meaning here is that um, an offering is being made, right? Um, satkritim and moksha, right? And so it's really like fascinating and really beautiful that someone as someone as like Shil Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, who can really get in there deep and really see what's going on. Like he's writing these beautiful, beautiful passages of what's what's actually happening here. And we see this really personal, personal exchange between the gopis and Krishna, where um, this idea of Sanchari Bhava, and this, honestly, I've tried to understand, I like understand it on a preliminary level. And I think even saying that is, is is um puffing myself up a little bit like this whole rasa tattva and all the different types of bhavas um it's actually quite complex you know i i remember i started reading the the last chapter uh, the last section rather the last section of shila bhakti vinod thakur's jiva dharma which is about rasa tattva and it was like really confusing <laughs> and i had to i had to pause and i had to be like okay let me start over. Let me do this. And it's really complex. It's really technical, um, but really beautiful as well. And he really gets into the, the science between uh, behind all of these tattvas. Um, but this is really, really beautiful. Um, how Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is explaining the, the Sanchari Bhavas, or what are called the Vyabhi Chari Bhavas. And um, this is the definition that's given in Jaiva Dharma by Bhaktivinoda Thakur is that it is one of the five ingredients of rasa, and they are 33 internal spiritual emotions that rise from the ocean of stai bhava. And that's as far as I'll go with that. I won't go too <laughs> deeper into that because I'm not qualified to, and I don't completely have a full grasp that I can teach that point. Um, but I think the main aspect that's being shared here, and it's the main aspect that I'd like to get across, 
is that the the word in itself is not just itself right there's a deeper story there's a deeper meaning here there's a deeper exchange of reciprocation that is going on between the gopis that is going on between the gopis and krishna and i like all these sounds that are being made and um and this is what leads me to my main point um where cuz you know we're reading these really beautiful esoteric stories um pastimes rather of uh between krishna and the gopis krishna and vrindavan and the question always uh comes at least for me well what does this have to do with me and my spiritual life or how can i apply these teachings to my spiritual life what's going on with me in this day um you know in whatever i was going to say in new york city wherever we may be in this material world and so the bigger kind of theme that i'm taking from this is the idea of reciprocation right the idea of these exchanges the idea of my um my 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 desire and my longing in my heart to see krishna and to remember krishna um how that's actually super important and it might be quite subtle um and others might not see my hankering or see the desires in my heart for krishna but it's actually quite 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 very 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 important and i think this is actually really important you know um i guess what i'm trying to say is that to the degree that we are looking for krishna that is the degree that he will come to us you know this very famous in bhagavad gita ye yatam mam prapadyante tam stataiva bajamya ham that as we surrender to krishna he will reciprocate accordingly as we surrender as people surrender unto me i will reciprocate accordingly this is krishna's words in bhagavad gita <clears throat> and the other part of that verse which i think is really fascinating um let's see if i can remember the sanskrit mama vartman vartante mm, i don't remember the last line but that actually all all people are following this path all people are searching for krishna right we're actually all looking for krishna we might not know it right we might not know that we're seeking for krishna but all people are are looking for krishna and following his path even though they might not know it and this is really fascinating because you know if we think of the name krishna krishna means all attractive um the one that attracts all of our senses and there are various parts in the gita chapter 7 and i think chapter 10 um where krishna is speaking about his vibhutis or his opulences or how he manifests in the world um and he is imminent in it right um uh, these are the verses where krishna is saying things like i am the taste in water right i am the strength um in men i am the intelligence in men i am the sound of om right all these really beautiful verses and <clears throat> i was listening to a lecture by his holiness radhanath swami the other day yesterday two days ago and it was really wonderful he was making this point specifically this point that we're all seeking for krishna that we're all looking for krishna even in our um even in our you know vices actually we're all seeking for krishna this lecture that ranath maharaj was giving was specifically about um the senses and krishnaizing the senses or krishnifying the senses and he was speaking about desire and how when we are doing something we're trying to get some reciprocation out of it we're trying to get some joy some satisfaction out of it and that which we're trying to get out of it that's 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 krishna that's what we're searching for that joy that attraction he even went so far um to say which i thought was um actually he was mentioning that Shrila Prabhupada used to say this. He was saying that um is specifically in regards to this verse that I am the taste in in water. He was saying that Shrila Prabhupada used to say um uh that if a man is addicted to drinking wine, right? Cuz earlier Maharaj Ranath Maharaj made the point that 
Krishna is the taste in water, but really the taste in all liquids, right? So he he was remembering in the lecture about Srila Prabhupada, and he was saying that Srila Prabhupada used to say that if a man is addicted to drinking wine, and he thinks due to his conditioning that wine is the sweetest and most wonderful flavor, and it gives the most pleasant feeling, then this Srila Prabhupada, then you should tell him, uh, meditate on Krishna. Meditate that Krishna is the taste of your wine. Hmm. And it is the truth, right? This is Maharaj now speaking. It's the truth because Krishna is the cause of all causes. Nothing exists outside of his energies, right? He's imminent in all material things. So Sri Prabhupada was saying that when they drink the wine and if they are meditating in Krishna in this way and they're appreciating that Krishna is in this substance even, then gradually and gradually their hearts will become purified by remembrance of Krishna and they will lose the desire to drink this wine and instead they will take nice prasad. And Prabhupada was also saying this about cigarettes, <laughs> that actually what's in the cigarette that someone likes, that a person likes, is Krishna, right? That's such an awesome, interesting, beautiful way of thinking about it. And of course, someone in the audience uh, asked Ravnath Swami uh, at the end of his lecture, this was like a devotee, like a practicing devotee asking him, oh, so then if if Krishna is the taste in wine, then that means I can just <laughs> I can just drink wine and um, and be Krishna conscious. <laughs> and Radhanath Maharaj immediately, you know, with his kind of he has a booming voice, was just like no, <laughs> very loudly. He was like no, not for you, not for you. He was like this instruction is for someone who is already um, addicted to wine or you know whatever. Um, this is not for you, right? And so it's really interesting, a few points on this, because coming back to this main point, now I really want to know what the last Sanskrit, oh, manusya parta sarvashaha, right? That um, I will reciprocate with people accordingly how they surrender to me. And all people follow my path, whether they know it or not. And so bhakti and the practice of Krishna consciousness is so broad and so inclusive and so wide reaching that even, you know, even people who are, who are suffering from addictions, suffering from a vice, they can practice Krishna consciousness. Doesn't that amazing? I think that's so beautiful. And they can practice Krishna consciousness by remembering Krishna in, in those moments, and eventually their hearts will become purified. And I think that this is really, really, really important because what Srila Prabhupada is showing us in his example is that the way that Krishna will reciprocate with us is specifically unique to our individual situation. And that's a really important point here, that how Krishna will, will manifest to us, how he will reciprocate with us is extremely specific to our situation, right? So, you know, I'm not a drunk, so I'm not going to go and drink wine just because now I can practice Krishna consciousness that way, right? That doesn't make sense for me in my life. And that's what Radhanath Swami was telling this person who asked the question. However, if someone is suffering from a vice of alcoholism or cigarette smoke or et cetera, whatever it might be, you know, I think that there's a tendency perhaps to shrug people off of mm, they're not, you know, they're not meeting the standards or they're not, they don't look the part to practice uh, Krishna consciousness. So I'm not even going to bother speaking to them about it. And that's not the mood. That's not the case, right? Um, Srila Prabhupada was so merciful that he made room for anyone and everyone in his movement, um, which was so beautiful. And actually, that's the philosophy. Like, actually, that's that's what's being said here. And so, and so, this is um, hmm, really interesting because going back to the 
pastime of the gopis, and I'll end soon because I want to have a little bit of a discussion on this. Because like I said, I'm not going to go too much into the into the explanations of the rasa tattva and etc. But just this main point that I'm trying to make that even though we are not at the level of the gopis, um, because we're not, I'm not, even though we are not at the level of the gopis, we can still have reciprocation with Krishna. We can still have pastimes with Krishna. And we can still deepen our relationship with Krishna. And it behooves us eventually to move out of, you know, it's it's important. <clears throat> this is where I, I, I get a little blurry on... Um, on lines and boundaries of, I think everyone has their own specific practice, of course. Um, and we should all be following our, our regulative principles and, and chanting our, our rounds and et cetera. Um, but that can also become quite mechanical if not, if not done in the correct mood, if not done in the, uh, under proper supervision. And, you know, when our kind of, um, let's use the word regulative, when our kind of more regulative practices become ritualized or ritualistic and they lose a sense of emotion or a sense of bhav, as we say, right? A sense of personalism or uniqueness or love, then they are just empty. Hmm? And so that, that, that loving reciprocation with Krishna needs to be there. And, you know, just a personal example <clears throat> for me, um, and I'm sure we all have these stories, and I'd love to hear different stories of reciprocation with Krishna. Maybe we can go there um, for our last uh, 15 minutes. But I, ever since, I think it was in June or July last year, I started doing Pujari Seva. And I know the Pujaris are, are there listening. And Pujari Seva is so beautiful. It's one of my favorite Sevas to do. And, and I will tell you that there's been some very interesting pastimes <laughs> that Krishna has had with me during Pujari Seva, where Krishna likes to play tricks, where Krishna likes to make things kind of difficult sometimes. And I remember one of one of my most recent moments where af after the after it happened, during I was just not really thinking about anything. But after it happened, I realized, oh wow, I was I was really focused on getting Krishna what he needed. And I wasn't really thinking about anything else. That was, that was a really nice feeling. And it was just, and I'm sure all Pujaris have been through this where, um, you know, you're, or at least I was running late. And usually I'm not someone who likes to run late. I, um, I plan ahead for cushion time because I don't like being rushed. But New York is a city, for those of you that are here, you know, and for those of you who aren't here, you might not know, but it's a city where the train system has its own, its own um, schedule, <laughs> its own mind. And so I did everything correct. I woke up, you know, um, early. I was getting on the train at exactly the correct time. And there were so many delays and it took me so long to um, get to the Bhakti Center that I think I arrived maybe like, I don't know, maybe like 12 minutes before I was supposed to be on the altar or 10 minutes before I was supposed to be on the altar, something really crazy like that. And it was the fastest that I've ever taken a shower. It was the fastest that I've ever put on a dhoti. It was the fastest that I ever put on tilak. I was just in a absolute, just insane, you know, um, frenetic kind of days just like running 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 to make sure that krishna um that everything was on time for krishna and i think that this is really Im important to 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 note actually you know this was my experience and it was really beautiful for me and i had this moment of afterwards in retrospect like wow i was really just like absorbed that felt really nice to be absorbed but i think you know i wanted to make this point earlier but i forgot to make it I think that when we have opportunities to approach Krishna personally, we really need to take those opportunities. And what I mean by that is, you know, in the temple, we have the deities and the deities are Krishna. 
And it's really important to, um, to remember that, to practice that, to take it seriously, you know? And the more that I open my heart and the more that I take my relationship with Radha Mulidhar, Gaurachandra, um, or whatever deities we might be serving, the more that we take that, that relationship seriously, the, the more that the reciprocation will become evident and it will become clear. The more that I treat it casually and kind of just as, oh, yeah, they're there or, you know, like whatever, or I'll see them when I see them or, you know, these kinds of mundane thoughts, then the, the mystery or the magic won't unfold itself. You know, when we read these kinds of pastimes between Krishna and the gopis, it can seem very far away. You know, it's it's so magical. It's so esoteric. It's so personal. And it can seem kind of um, far. But actually, that that mystery, I think, um, is there for us. Um, but we have to approach it in the way that, um, in a sincere way, with an open heart. And so that's basically the main point that I wanted to make today. I don't want to go on too much further. Um, the main point being reciprocation and taking our relationship with Krishna seriously and that Krishna is everywhere if we look for him and that actually all the, all the desires, all the hankerings, all the things that we're trying to suck enjoyment out of in this material world, what we're actually looking for is Krishna and what we are enjoying in those things when we finally get them is Krishna. And so the more that I can uh, wear these Krishna goggles or see or understand this point that what I'm actually looking for is Krishna, then the more that the reciprocation will unfold accordingly and I'll be able to see, wow, Krishna is really there for me. You know, Krishna is really manifesting um, himself in my life through you know, X, Y, and Z, and we'll be able to enter into kind of that, that magic, um, that mystery, that, that, you know, that, that, that esotericness of, of bhakti. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll make this last point um, and I'll leave 10 minutes. I think sometimes it's, we get really caught up um, in the idea of, um, of like, I'm a good devotee, I'm a bad devotee, he's a good devotee, he's a bad devotee, you know, oh, they are doing something bad and, you know, wrong, and uh, therefore they're not qualified or et cetera, you know, or I'm doing something bad and therefore I'm not qualified or whatever. Um, and I really, really love that, um, you know, in this lecture that Maharaj gave, just to remind us of that point that, that, that this Krishna consciousness, this bhakti, this practice is actually there for everyone. And, and Srila Prabhupada even was giving this suggestion to people that were, that were, you know, drinking wine or these people that were smoking cigarettes, like actually meditate on Krishna while you do these things. And eventually your heart will become purified. And it's a really, really beautiful point of of remembrance for us and of instruction for us as, as people here in, you know, trying to share Krishna consciousness that we're not, our, our goal is not to condemn people or to say, you know, everything you're doing is wrong or et cetera. And it's actually to help them hmm, enter into that loving relationship with Krishna. And if that's their entry point, then so be it. You know, like if that's their entry point, then then it is what it is. And eventually, Sri Prabhupada is saying, eventually that taste for that material thing that they are fixated on, it will eventually um, decrease and diminish. And so, yes, if we see, if we practice seeing Krishna in everything and everywhere, right? Krishna is saying in Bhagavad Gita that I am... Uh, that for one who sees me in everything and everything in me, I am never lost to him and he is never lost to me, right? And it's such a beautiful verse. And so this idea of seeing Krishna, of deepening our relationship with Krishna, um, will help us um, follow in the footsteps of the residence of Braj, which is the purpose of our bhakti 
um, movement. So I'll end there. We have 10 minutes and I would love to hear some, of course, if there's any questions, um, but I'd love to hear some, some stories of reciprocation. Um, stories of reciprocation. Hmm. We have Ananda Manjari and Bhima Prabhu. Ananda Manjari. Hare Krishna, thank you for this class. I, I don't want to speak about stories of reciprocation. I wanted to uh, come back to one of the points that you made and add a little bit there. Um, so one thing that came to me when it comes to even uh, finding ourselves in, in judgments of other devotees or other people who are uh, practicing different spiritual paths, it, it reminded me of uh, the words of Raghunath Das Goswami who actually said that um, everybody is is coming and worshiping Krishna and serving Krishna according to their realization. And I was just meditating on that for past week, just thinking like, what does it mean to truly just say they are doing their best according to their level of realization? Um, mm -hmm. And then... In the same way you're speaking about finding Krishna and the taste of wine, if, there are, if this vice is present. And I just wanted to point out the language that it seemed like, oh, this is what other people do. And I just felt very strongly like, oh, yeah, but I also have my own vices. They, it, not may be, it may not be wine. It may not be something else. But still, What is it, so Ananda Manjari? What is it? <laughs> what are my vices? Just... Yeah. So many. I don't want to name because I yeah. don't want to shame myself. <laughs> but please pray for me since you already want to know. You can pray that there are many. So I just want to name that, that there are many things that are still to be addressed and, and to not even say other people do this, but to actually look at ourselves. And, and so that's that um, that I wanted to bring. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ananda Mandri. Actually, thank you for making this point because it was a point that I, I was going to make and I forgot um, that that actually this, this realization that what we're looking for is Krishna in all things, whether they be vice or, or piety, that realization has helped me. I'm very hard on myself and it can help us be a little bit more compassionate towards ourselves, you know, because I think that when, when there are vices that we're trying you know, to, to, to move out of our system or whatever. Um, it can get very much caught in this, I'm bad and I have all these vices or I'm great and I'm an awesome devotee, you know, which that's a whole nother story. Um, but this realization or this understanding that, you know, actually I have some conditioning, I have some past karma, whatever it might be, et cetera, but I'm just looking for Krishna, you know, I'm just looking for Krishna. And, and therefore it becomes less of like, I'm an awful person and I'm a bad devotee and I'm looking for, you know, I have all these vices and it becomes more, actually, I have these vices. This is, this is what it is, but really what I want is Krishna out of all this. And that remembrance of Krishna, um, Maharaj, Ranath Maharaj was speaking in the, in his lecture that that remembrance of Krishna in our moments of vice will eventually purify our hearts. And so, so Krishna is doing the magic, you know, he, he is the one who's going to purify our hearts and all we have to do is remember him, which is so beautiful. I think Bhima Prabhu had, had something to say, right? Yeah. Ananda. In fact, Bhima Prabhu. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, Kishore Chandra. What does that name mean? Does that mean young moon? Kishore yes. Chandra? <laughs> Wonderful. What a wonderful lecture as well. Um, I very quickly, see if I can condense this. I had uh, a little story of vacation. And that was, uh, I, when I first started my business uh, some 30 years back, uh, I had a couple of stands outside Fenway Park and um, uh, had some employees. And uh, I had, uh, at night, I would, uh, of course, come by and, and, and pick up and, and um, pack up and uh, people would be coming out of the stadium and one time and I'd have my puppy with me uh, at the time um, who was also named Krishna 
um, a, a little bit longer name. And uh, when th these two uh, drunken old men, 80, they had to have been near 80, and they were drunken, and they it, we, and they came up and they said, "Oh, we love your dog, you know what's his name?" And I said, "Krishna." And uh, both of them raised their eyes really high, and one of them, who I later learned whose name was Charlie, old Charlie, he uh, went and started telling me about he knew Prabhupada uh, back on Twenty Six Second Avenue back in the '60s. He had he had go gone many times. Uh, told a couple of pastimes, uh, Prabhupada receiving a watch and giving it a, or giving it to the devotees to cash in, uh, and didn't keep it for himself, told him about how he said to Prabhupada once he saw a roach climbing on one of them, and he said, Prabhupada, what do I do? And, and uh, Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna to the roach. And he was telling me all these pastimes. Now they were they were old, eighty something years old. They were drunk. One of them, he had a bag, of course, holding on to of all things uh, a bottle of wine. And I was astonished at the time. Um, I was somewhat taken aback, not having <laughs> dealt ever with an old drunken devotee for all in circumstances so anyways he used to visit him and his friend and his friend used to say he this charlie is my guru he teaches me all about krishna and and radharati and stuff like that um and th these guys i guess were bums that had been that way for decades since the 60s and now it was to 2000 uh or, or um nine, uh, 1995 uh, Five, I'm, I'm sure of the year 1995. Um, but long story short, uh, several visits. One time, I was very upset about you know the fruits of my evening, for how much money I made, and there was a there was something going on that was disturbing me. And he wandered up. Charlie wandered up, and he was in one of his drunken, uh, uh, inebriated states, and he started singing Chintamani. The whole song in Sanskrit, just sitting there with his red nose and red cheeks singing Chintamani. I, I don't even know the words, but beautifully. And I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I was annoyed at uh, what had happened in the night's uh, income, the results of the night. And I, in order to get away from him and, and proceed with my work, because he was sort of like in my face singing Chindamani, and I was too preoccupied. And so I took a $20 bill out and I handed it to him. I said, is this what you need? You know, does this help or something like that? And he looked at me and he had, he had red eyes. He all of a sudden had tears in his eyes. And he goes, and he goes, this is why I became a Christian. He goes, uh, he goes, because I didn't want to be judged. And um, I never saw him again after that. And I never forgot. It's been 30 some odd years since then. But I, I, I never forgot that I had the chance to be friends with and to help support and see this man through probably he's gone now through his last days and sing Chintamani with him. Let him teach me uh, despite his addiction to wine that he added in him to always come down and all he would talk about when he would come and see me after the games would be Krishna and Prabhupada. And that one time I just was uh, too caught up. So my question is, of course, is who was the intoxicated one in that exchange and who was the intoxicated one in general? So I learned a great lesson from that, and I, I, I hope this is appropriate to the class that you gave, but um, it, we always have to watch our hearts to understand that there are many types of intoxication and many types of vices that we have that are not, that are more subtle and more insinuous, uh, insidious uh, than the four regulative principles, um, and one of them being pride and uh, attachment to anything in this world that we'll never be able to understand uh, Bhav with Krishna, as long as we have one iota of attachment to this world. And we'll never understand the song Chintamani until, uh, as long as we have one iota of attachment to the fruits of our labor. 
So thank you very much, Prabhu, for reminding me of that. I had forgotten about that for decades. Hare Krishna. That was beautiful, Bhima Prabhu. Bhima Prabhu is a Vaishnava. This is a Vaishnava speaking. And maybe um, Charlie is watching this class in a new body. Who knows? We don't know. Maybe I am Charlie. Sure, Chandra. Maybe you're Charlie. I'm going to take you sure. Maybe you're Charlie. Okay. Who who would like to go next? A, a question or a, a story of reciprocation? I see it's 801. Darshan is about to happen. I personally love the point that Kishore Chandra Prabhu almost forgot to make, but then made that. Okay. Shishirana Mulidar, Kijai. Darshan time, cameras on, please. Devotees, please, if you can. Okay. Kishore Chandra Prabhu Kijai, Shrimad Bhagavatam class Kijai. Charlie, if you're listening to this, we're not judging you. We want you back, Charlie. Srila Prabhupada Kijai. Thank you very much, dear devotees. Kishore Chandra Prabhu, great class. Everybody enjoyed the story. Everybody is relating. Yeah. I'm relating to the shower story sometimes. I feel very Krishna conscious taking shower. Okay. Mm. 
All right, dear devotees, thank you very much. Come again tomorrow. Shemad Bhagavatam never ends. Thank you so much for being part of this family. We love you dearly. Hare Krishna, Hare Rama.